How do you like the Gospel of John so far? It's pretty exciting, isn't it? This is our third week in this series. Uh, we're going to go for about four months in the Gospel of John. Uh, but I, I love the stories. And next week, we'll see Nicodemus, uh, then the woman at the well, uh, then the woman, well, a different woman caught in adultery, uh, the man born blind. Uh, we'll see Lazarus and meet his sisters, Mary and Martha. I love the themes that John uses. You can see the brilliance of this man as the Holy Spirit worked through him. I, a, a week or two ago, I called him a, a philosopher fisherman or a fisherman philosopher, I don't know which. But you can just have this strong sense that he's thought about this and prayed about this and, and his mind is very organized. Now, to be honest, they didn't have paper and pencil available at, at every place in their lives or any place in their lives. And so John uh, organized these things, certainly in his mind and the Holy Spirit was at work. Well, one of the themes of John is I am. And uh, that is three letters, I and then A-M, I am. And uh, you may be aware of the fact that in the Greek, they don't really have past and present. Uh, they do have future, but they have complete and incomplete action. And so when we see completed action, that's kind of past. And when we see incomplete, that's kind of present, mostly. And so when Jesus says, I am, for example, in chapter four, he says, I am he. And uh, that's quite a statement because the woman at the well has just said, you know, we're waiting for the Messiah. We think he's going to come to our mountain where we can worship him. And Jesus says, I am he. And it wasn't just the he, but the I am is that incomplete action, that ongoing action. He says in chapter six, I am the bread of life. And uh, bread was sustenance. Bread was what fed people so much of the time back then. And uh, even if they had something with bread, bread was kind of the main part of many meals. But when he says, I am, he's indicating something a lot more about himself than simply that I'm crusty or I'm made of wheat or anything like that. Verse uh, chapter 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And at this point, it's pretty obvious that he's making a claim that he is God. Uh, chapter 15, he says, I am, the I am the vine and you are the branches. And at this point, as through his ministry, he constantly says, I am. People get the idea that he is more than just a man that he is claiming to be more than just a man, but by his teachings and by his miracles, he's showing that he is more than just a man. As a matter of fact, we'll take a look at chapter eight at some point coming up. And he, he's having an, uh, a, a heated discussion, shall we call it, a confrontation with the religious leaders. And when they say, you've not seen Abraham, you know, and you're not yet 50 years old. How can you talk with such authority about Abraham? And Jesus says, before Abraham was born, I am. You think back to Exodus chapter three of God saying to Moses, tell them that I am has sent you. And the religious leaders know what Jesus is saying. Well, we'll come to that at a later time. Let's go back to John chapters one and two, because we see some big statements that are very easy to overlook. Uh, already we've talked about, in the beginning was the word, through him all things were made, the word became flesh, behold the lamb of God. So those are already big statements that we've looked at the last couple of weeks. Well, let's take a look at John 1, 14 through 18. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, 
Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father. Uh, and so he has made God known, uh, made him known. Well, verse 14 is very familiar. The word became flesh and had made his dwelling among us. Um, verse 15 is too. John testified concerning him. This is the one I spoke about. We can know the Father through the creation. We can know him through the Old Testament. We know him because we're made in his image. We have an inherent sense of someone greater than ourselves. And so it's not unusual except that John has had an amazing ministry. The, the most wealthy, the most powerful, you know, the, the, the best known people, if they had actors and actresses back in that day, they came out to. Uh, but they all came out and it could have swelled John's head, but he knew why he was there to fulfill God's purpose. Well, verse 16, to me, is an amazing verse that we just gloss over way too often. Uh, out of his fullness, we have, all, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. What exactly is this saying? It's saying that in the Old Testament times, they had received grace. John says, you've already received grace. What kind of grace? What are you talking about? Wasn't there law? Weren't they all condemned because of the law? Well, yes, but think about the sacrifices that they made. It was a substitutionary sacrifice where an animal took their place. And because of the shedding of blood of the animal, that their sins were at least pushed forward and, and I believe that the sins of the Old Testament people, when they made sacrifices, that they were pushed forward to the cross and that all sins are forgiven only through the blood of Jesus. But they received grace at that time because they could go to the temple, they could make their sacrifice and they could walk away feeling forgiven. They could walk away knowing that God was active in their lives and, and that God cared about them and about their sin. You know, this grace is mercy where punishment is deserved. And that's what we receive through Jesus. We certainly need his salvation because we cannot save ourselves. We cannot forgive ourselves. We cannot do enough good to undo the evil that we have done and that we've had in our hearts, the things that we've ignored that God has been telling us to do. Grace is God's giving nature and he gives forgiveness. He gives eternal life through Jesus. Moses did give grace um, in part through the law because God showed them how they were to live. That's a whole lot better than expecting them to know without telling them. And we learn a lot from our Old Testaments, don't we? But we see God at work through Moses, through the things that he taught and showed them, but especially through Jesus. Well, Let's go to verse 16, because he says, well, we've already talked about that. Uh, out of his fullness, we have all received gra <clears throat> grace in place of grace. Uh, grace in place. Yeah, freedom. Freedom that we have in Jesus, uh, not by law keeping. That's impossible because we cannot be perfect, but by the blood of Jesus. Let's go to Galatians chapter three. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you had heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the spirit, in other words, coming to Christ, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? In other words, by the law. Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. 
So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Uh, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So the grace that we receive from the Old Testament or that they receive from the Old Testament was in part the sacrifices, in part it was the faith of Abraham. It was knowing that we could put our trust in God and walk with him and that he indeed would reward uh, what, what, uh, what we did in, in hearing the name and, and believing him. Well, let's move down in that chapter, uh, Galatians 3.23. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So how do we come to Jesus? How do we receive the blessings that he has brought to us? How do we understand the Old Testament properly and the grace that, that came there? Well, as has been said, it's through faith. That's what he says in verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. But I want you to notice that next verse too. The connecting word there is for. So that's built on what came before it. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So baptism is a part of faith. Too many people look at baptism and say, well, it's a work. It can't be part of salvation. That's not what Paul says here. There's no place in the scripture that identifies baptism as a work. I know sometimes people make it a work and that's not my intent. But look at the connection between verses 26 and 27. Part of our faith in coming to Christ is baptism. When we properly understand that we're dying to sin and self, you know, that's, that's not a work. We're buried with him. That's not a work. Somebody else is doing the burying. And we come up out of the water. We're resurrected with him. Look at Romans chapter six as well. You know, somebody else is lifting us up, but the spirit is at work because of the faith that is in the person being baptized. I, I've seen people that didn't have any understanding of, of, uh, of what salvation meant. I've seen them get dunked in the tank. Um, you know, it's not up to me to say whether they were saved or unsaved, but if they didn't have faith in God, I, I would have a problem with baptizing them and uh, want people to, to have that true understanding of who God is and what Jesus has done so that it is indeed part of our faith in coming to Christ. Make sure you look at the little words in many of these passages here. I love Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. Amen. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know, we're talking all about grace here, all about salvation that, that started uh, become, becoming known back in Moses' day, at least. And, uh, you know, you can go all the way back to Cain and Abel making sacrifices to God. God made certain to humble us to know that our need for God was greater than our need for these possessions and belongings, even to, to own and control ourselves. Let's go back to John chapter two. 
John chapter 2, verse 4, Jesus says, Woman, why do you involve me? <laughs> you know, they were at a wedding feast and they ran out of wine. And Jesus says to his mother, Woman, <laughs> what does this have to do with me? Jesus replied, he said, My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Jesus understood his purpose very, very well. He understood why it was important for him to, to gather the disciples together, to be able to choose 12, to, to be able to prepare them. And, you know, by the time the day of Pentecost came, there were 120 people in the upper room. I'm guessing that most or all of them had walked with Jesus and, and had, had listened to his teaching and had been with him much of the time so that they also were prepared but here it is, the first miracle that, that Jesus is going to do, turning water into wine. And I don't know if he was asking uh, more uh, of the father, you know, is, is this something I should do? Or if he's telling mom, hey, don't push on this. You know, the time will come <laughs> at the right time. But he says, my hour has not yet come. Jesus will be patient, waiting for the right time. Um, he is lightly chastising his mother for pushing him, but I can't say that it's too hard. Well, John chapter seven, after this, Jesus went around Galilee. He did not want to go into Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish feast, uh, a Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works that you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Were they wanting him to be killed? I don't know. Uh, Joseph's brothers didn't treat him that much differently, did they? Therefore, Jesus told them, my time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I'm not going up to this festival because my time is not yet fully come. After he had said this, he stayed in Galilee. Now, eventually he went up to the festival, but he didn't go up publicly. He didn't go showing himself that he was uh, was on his way. Well, Jesus changes the water into, into wine. Jesus goes up to the festival. And so he is still very active in, uh, in, in accomplishing God's purpose, but it's not until the time uh, for him to be crucified that he really uh, puts himself out there in that way. Uh, let's go back to John 2, 23 through 25. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. I find this fascinating. You would have thought that Jesus would have been kind of a kind of a do-gooder, kind of a, oh, I love everyone, I trust everyone, everyone's good. But Jesus knew what was in people. I remember years ago, one of my professors in college had been a chaplain in the in the army. I, I believe during World War II, uh, he's since passed away. But while he was in the army, it became known that he didn't drink any alcohol. That was part of his witness. And uh, he would have some of these uh, young soldiers come up to him and offer him a bottle of Coke and say, here, chaplain, uh, you know, have, have this. And he would see that it was already open and he knew what they were doing. They just figured, you know, Chaplin doesn't know what a good time it is to get drunk, and so we're going to help him. Or they tried to make sport of him. But he was shrewd, and he refused their offer. You know, Jesus didn't trust what was in all of these people. He knew what was in their hearts, and yes, there were some that he could trust. But so many times, the people he worked with, he, he knew they were trying to trick him or trap him. And so he kept teaching, he kept working, but he didn't put himself in a position where they could hurt him. There was a time that he got pushed to the edge of a cliff, but he was able to walk through because it wasn't his time yet. Oh yeah, that's back to the previous one. But Jesus knew what was in every heart. I have to tell you that we have to be careful. We have to watch out. P.T. Barnum lives. You know what the, the whole saying is there, right? 
that there's a sucker born every minute and two born to take his money. We, we have to be very careful to do what God wants us to do. I'm not saying never help somebody standing by the side of the street with a cardboard sign, but I'm saying that, that we need to do things with wisdom. Maybe there are better ways that we can help people, not just give them money. And, and, and sometimes just giving them money, you know, I'm not responsible for how they spend it, but it's important. There are other times that people tried to, to trick Jesus. After Jesus fed them, they wanted to make him king. Why? So he could keep feeding them. That wasn't why he came. He took care of business the, the right way, made sure that, that he did the right thing. Well, it's important for us to draw near. It's important for us to, to read these statements and understand very clearly uh, what, what Jesus does. You know, Jesus knows what's in your heart and he knows what's in mine and he loves us anyways. Uh, when, when I read some of these scriptures, for example, Jeremiah 17, uh, five through 10, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Now, I would disagree with Jeremiah at one point here. He says the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I don't believe that the heart is beyond cure, but there's only one who can cure it. There's only one who can fix what's broken in us and what's wrong. We need to come to our heavenly father through his son, Jesus. We need to let the Holy Spirit be at work and we need to trust in his word and to understand his truth better and better so that the spirit has more to work with inside of us. God is able to cure our broken hearts and able to help us. God understands. Now, Jeremiah is speaking in human terms, I understand. But to understand that the Lord searches the heart and examines the mind and that he rewards us, but he does more than that. He helps us and blesses us as we seek to live for him. Father, I thank you for the small, small statements that are big. Help us, Father, to understand more of your word and how it impacts us and how it applies to us so that it will impact the world. Thank you, Father, for every blessing. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Have a great Monday.